uh, for this. This is Unit 7. Uh, and this is our introduction to electricity. We're going to have uh, two parts of this unit. One's going to be chapter 20 and 21 where we introduce charges and the idea of charges and um, electric fields and forces as you see in the list here. And then uh, the second part is going to be more about the flow of those charges, you know, things that we call through things we call circuits and uh, things like that. So that's going to be the sequence that we're going to do. First, we're going to look at 20 and 21, which is charges, electric fields, and forces. Okay, I'm going to take a little bit of extra detail here, not just present the material, but also explain uh, how things work, because uh, a, a good conceptual grounding in this will go a long way to understanding actual you know, electricity and things like that. So, all right, let's get started. First, we've got to think about the atomic level of view, all right? And let's go inside of an atom. We ask, what kind of atom is this? This is a helium atom. How do I know it's a helium atom? All right, well, it has two protons right here in the nucleus. All right, uh, so it has two protons. Well, it's actually, I should I cheat a little bit. Let's uh, uh, get rid of those. Oops, wrong way. Uh, anyway, these are, so these are protons. One, we know that they're positive and um, then I have, these are neutrons here. They are neutral. Then out here in the electron cloud, of course we have electrons. Here we go. Electrons carry a negative charge. Protons carry a positive charge. Neutrons carry no net charge. And this is probably something a little bit, a little bit saying no net charge. And you've always just heard that they have no charge, right? Well. We'll look a little bit deeper and say it has no net charge. Um, the charge of an electron and the charge of a proton are exactly the same. So we call this a neutral atom because it has two positives and two negatives. But in order for them to be actually neutral, the it's just not just positive and negative, it's how much, right? So uh, this has two values of charge positive and this must have two values of charge negative. What we call that value of charge of a proton or an electron is called the fundamental charge, right? So that is the fundamental charge, all right? What we use for the fundamental charge is what we denote it with E. E is, the, is what we say the fundamental charge is. Now, E does stand for, in a way, electrons or something else like that, but, you know, again, a proton has the same charge except for just positive. Is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, all right? And C stands for coulombs. Okay, Coulomb was a French scientist who helped uh, set this standard up. So we named it after him, Coulomb. Coulomb. Um, and so uh, we call it a fundamental charge because it's the smallest amount of charge that has ever been isolated. There are smaller charges. Technically, like if I take a proton, right, here's my proton right here. All right, there's actually, within the proton, there are things called quarks. Now, a quark has never, ever, ever, ever been isolated. We've never seen a quark by itself. And actually, in those quarks, there are, you know, I forgot what, fractions of charges of two-thirds, one-third, and some, you know, positive and negative and things like that. Um, Pretty interesting that both the proton and the neutron are made up of quarks, but just different combinations. And so that's, you know, a in a proton, you have three quarks. In a neutron, you have three quarks, too. Uh, it just so happens that in a proton, when you add up all the charges, you get a positive. In a neutron, when you add up all the charges, you get no charge at all. That's why we say there's no net charge. There are charges within uh, under, uh, under it. But they're always le they're lower than fundamental charge because they've never been isolated. So we we for the most part we've we found that we can ignore that. So now let's think about um, let's think about messing with this atom. I'm gonna mess with this atom first. What if I were to take away an electron? Oh, sorry. Uh, Grab these slides here, they build. Uh, electrons are also fundamental charges because they made no, no smaller part. You can't break up an electron. Uh, and we already talked about quarks. Each quark is a fraction of fundamental. Okay. okay. I already said those, so you can read that right there. Uh, by the way, yeah. So the charge of a proton is positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. Right, positive. 
and a charge of the electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Now, these are the same charge, but they are wildly different uh, masses. First of all, they are both extremely, extremely small and extremely, extremely light. Okay, but if you look at this order of magnitude here between these two, right, essentially you're talking about three orders of magnitude or about a thousand times heavier. A proton is about a thousand times heavier, more than a thousand times heavier than an electron. Okay, so they behave much, much differently. And again, that's the difference between a bicycle and a truck, you know, so they may have the same charge overall, but they're, you know, they're wildly different in size. And, and again, most of the mass, you know, come from protons and neutrons. Electrons are so small that, you know, if you lose an electron or something else like that, you, you know, we don't, we don't even say that. We barely keep track where they, you know, change any mass at all. All right. Now, first, if I take away an electron, so I just take this one and I say, bye-bye. I send it away. All right, this is called ionization. Okay, ionization. Now, what you're still left with is a helium atom with one electron. Now, I know helium is a bad example for you chemistry nerds, but um, helium would become positive afterwards, right? Because you have an imbalance, you have two positives and only one negative. And this is relatively easy to do. And, and I know helium is a bad example for that, but you know, it's simple in other ways. So it's relatively easy to steal an electron. Okay, we got that? Now, if I take away a proton, take this thing away, all right, this is actually, we have a name for it, it's not ionization. Um, actually, by the way, if I took away a neutron, that would be an isotope, okay, fine. Um, if I took away a proton, this is called fission, nuclear fission which is, you know, atomic bomb type stuff, you know, re nuclear reactor type stuff, which is extremely hard to do. And guess what? When you're left over, you don't have helium anymore. You have something else. You now have two hydrogen atoms. This is now a hydrogen and that, you know, whatever took off right there was a hydrogen atom. So it's no longer the same material. It's no longer the same material. So if I, if I, if I take some electrons, no big deal. Fine. Right. Yes, yeah, some elements like helium are harder to do than others, uh, but if I take a proton, this is a huge deal, and it is not something that you know happens on a regular basis. Some elements like that are heavy, like plutonium, uranium, yes, they're so wild and unstable in the nucleus, they're like, please, please, please take some of this away. But for the most part, taking away taking away in, uh, a proton is a big, big deal. Alright, so the question is, if I have a negatively charged object, this is some ball or some sphere, uh, hollow or not, if I have a negatively charged uh, object, is it negative because it's, well, we know there's an imbalance between protons and electrons, but is it negative because there uh, have been protons taken away, or there, is it negative because electrons have been added? And it should be obvious at this point going through that it's the electrons have been added because again, taking away and subtracting you know, and adding electrons is no big deal. But protons, whew, that is a tough, tough thing. All right, if I start adding protons to this, then I'm either adding mass to the same element or if I'm adding you know, protons to the nuclei in here, I'm making new elements, right? So that's a big deal, all right? So we, what we say is that this sphere has an excess of electrons. Too many electrons are on it. It has more electrons than protons. All right. Now, if we change this and we said, okay, well, let's. What about uh, if it's all positively charged? I'll make all of these positively charged here, or just say that it has an overall positive charge. Now, what do we say there? Well, I'd say that either it has a deficiency of electrons at this point because again that imbalance is there, or it has an excess of protons. Either way, um, either way you say it, it's fine. Fine. Uh, we can actually quantify, all right, how much. Um, yeah, how many electrons have been added to something. Um, and uh, we can do that because we know that you can't take away half an electron, right? Or a half a proton, or you can't have an excess of 1.5 electrons. Because again, electrons are so fundamental that you can't break them apart. Uh, okay, even protons, yes, you kind of can, uh, technically with the quarks, but we can isolate them. But either way, 
we must be have increments like you can steal one electron, you can steal two electrons, three electrons, four electrons, five electrons. So you can find how much charge by by multiplying the fundamental charge by the number of excess. All right, you can find out how many electrons have been taken away, how many have been added. You can find out how many um, protons uh, are um, in excess, things like that. And the simple equation is I take the charge of the object, right, which is in coulombs, right, and I uh, and that is equal to the number of excess electrons or protons or whatever we're talking about times the fundamental charge. And again, that fundamental charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulomb. Coulomb, okay. So for example, you can have a charge, and we go all the way down to the basic thing here. I can have a charge that is this, all right? I can have one extra electron on here and it'll give me a negative charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. I can have two extra electrons on there. That would give me 3.2 times to the negative 19th. But I cannot have anything in between. Those two, uh, you know, there's nothing between those two charges in the same way that I can't have, you know, 0.8 times to the negative 19th coulombs because that is not possible because it has to be in increments, multiplications of the fundamental charge. Keep in mind, for the AP exam, this is their favorite thing to do when testing this. They don't want you to, oh, use this equation and calculate how many electrons are missing. Maybe they would one day, I don't know. But so far, what they love to do is show you something like, oh, one student is saying that, oh, that there are four times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. You need to know that that, that can't happen because it's not multiples of this, right? It's not multiples of this. Uh, technically, if this is a negative value, you can, you're finding the excess negative electrons, and if this is a positive value, you're finding the excess, you know, positive, um, you know, um, protons here. But either way, this number should always be, you know, a positive number. It's just a number, the number of excess. There's no units or anything else like that for it. So let's look at this example. If a one kilogram copper object has a net charge of 6.4 millicoulombs, which, by the way, since we're talking about coulombs, a coulomb is a big deal. That is a large amount of charge. Okay, so even a millicoulomb is a lot of charge. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, typically, we're going to be down in the micro and the nano coulomb realm. How many excess protons are there? How many total protons are there? Okay, so let's get get ready here. First, all right. Uh, I'm going to use my uh, equation that I just learned, Q equals N E, and I need to know the charge of the object. Okay, well that's been given to me as 6.4 millicoulomb. Alright, I'm trying to find the number of excess, which is this right here, and the number of excess, uh, and this is a positive, and since we're talking about protons, then I use positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. By the way, this equation is not on your uh, yellow sheet. It is something that you're going to need to bring into the exam in your head. Okay, uh, but the problem is that these are in coulombs and this is in millicoulombs. They both need to be in coulombs, so let's change this. Okay, a millicoulomb is the same as times 10 to the negative third coulombs. And this is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th Okay, um, so let's do it. 6.4 uh, EE, -E, you gotta use your friend, that EE -E buddy, uh, EE button, uh, divided by 1.6 EE negative 19. Oh, I should have known that. Okay, yeah, so 6.4 divided by 1.6 is 4. Uh, okay, uh, let's do it this. And then this is. You divide both sides by 10 to the negative 19th also, which then flips up and then partially cancels, so it becomes 10 to the 16th. All right, so 4 times 10 to the 16th is the answer, uh, and that is uh, just a number, right? Um, that's the number of excess protons. So there's that many protons that are in excess, which is saying that probably that many electrons have been stolen, which is a large, large amount. You know, for example, that is 4... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. All right, so that is, ooh, ooh, oops, not that one. And there, not that. So that's a lot of electrons that have been stolen. All right, but electrons are pretty cheap. Okay, how many total protons are there? Well, keep in mind that I have a whole bunch of excess ones. But if I think, th if I think this is a large number, then this is a very large number. Because remember, one kilogram of copper, you have to start going through, okay, um, molecular weights or molar masses and stoichiometry, uh, Avogadro's number, all that kind of stuff like that uh, in order to get to that. But actually, that, that's a very, you know, very, very large number. Uh, I forgot what, 10 to the 20s, I can't remember. Uh, anyway, but that's a very, very large number, even larger than this. So there's still plenty of protons uh, and plenty of electrons that are around. Just, you know, some this many are unpaired, or not unpaired, or are lacking, I guess you can say. Okay, next thing is conservation of charge. Okay, we've heard the word conservation quite a bit now. We've had, cons well, back in uh, fourth grade, learned conservation of mass, or maybe you learned that in chemistry. Uh, then you had uh, conservation of momentum we talked about. Then we talked about conservation of energy. Now we're doing conservation of charge, and they all sound just the same. For example, they all say, you know, blank cannot be created or destroyed, but blank can only be transferred from one blank to another, all right? And so that's essentially what we're talking about. For a closed system, the amount of net charge is constant. Charges cannot be created or destroyed, but only transferred. For example, I have these right here. This sphere has too many electrons. And I'll go ahead and go like this. And I'll put a bunch on there. And this one has too many protons, right? Now, what's gonna happen is when I connect these together, when I touch them here in another slide, these electrons do not like hanging out with other electrons, right? They are like charges and they repel. All right, these protons are a little bit uncomfortable with having, being so close to other protons too, and they don't like that either, right? And then opposite charges, and they, they want some electrons to hang out in between them. They don't like being face-to-face -face with these guys, all right? So what's gonna happen is that these are going to repel from each other. They're gonna look for new paths and new areas where they can spread out, and these are gonna welcome the little visitors. Okay, so let's uh, let's start bringing them together. Um, yeah, so those excess charges do not want to be near each other. If you give them a path, they will transfer to the uh, area of less excess. So I do that, and so what happens is that you know this electron pops over, this electron pops over, right, and you know they start transferring over. But eventually they get to a point where there are just, you know, just as many excess of electrons over here as there are over here. And now this one right here has to make a decision, all right? I can stay over here and be a little bit cramped, or I can go over there and be equally cramped. And he has no, he has no motivation to go at all. And that's essentially when it stops. When it stops uh, moving or when it stops transferring is when it re reaches, uh, reaches electrostatic equilibrium. All right, and so for this closed system, which we have this little line around here saying there's a closed system, no outside charges coming in, the total amount of charge, which uh, before, sorry, I skipped that, my total charge before, oops, my total charge before was negative uh, three nanocoulombs plus one nanocoulomb is negative two nanocoulomb, okay? That means afterwards, after all this happens, right, and they, they connect together, and all this stuff moves over, I must also still have this same total, all right, I have to have this same total, all right, and so the question, then the uh, question becomes, what is the charge afterwards? Well, equilostatic equilibrium means that they must be equal afterwards, all right, now the, the misconception is that this one loses all of its charge and it gets transferred over to here. That's not true because after a certain point, this one, they have no motivation to go from one side to another. So this is called electrostatic equilibrium, all right? And usually it's just, it's, each one is, um, you know, is, is uh, half the total charge. Uh, when we 
transfer by touch, this is called discharge, all right? Um, and that's just a term that we have to, we have to use. Um, okay, there are some things, some materials that transfer charges easier or better than other materials. Uh, the materials that transfer charges easier. Um, actually, let's talk about this. Actually, let's look at these diagrams first. Um, so here I have a nucleus. We know around the nucleus you have electrons, but there are some electrons that are really, really tight in that are bound pretty well. They, they don't want to be stripped away. There's other ones that are out here and they're a little bit looser. Now in metals, the outside layers are pretty large and they actually pretty easily can easily go from here to here, you know, or here and then back or whatever. I mean, these are just, essentially they're almost like free, free agents. They're constantly swirling around and um, they're constantly going around. And so what we call this is a sea of electrons. There's like a sea of electrons that are going around here. Yes, they're kind of bound to here, but then they quickly become bound to this one. They're easily influenced. Now, for insulators, uh, this is metals uh, or conductors, but for insulators, these are pretty much tightly bound. So there's only these little quick jumps, and they don't do them all that often. All right? So the thing is, is that conductors allow this sea of electrons to flow very easily. So you know, electrons are, can leave a metal quickly, uh, but these extra electrons here you know, have a harder time, you know, going this kind of no man's land out here. Um, so conductors do that, uh, allow the sea to move easily, and insulators do not allow them to move as easily. All right, now, again, there's some movement there, it's just not as easy. And there's some, it's not a uh, binary thing and or, there's, there's things in between. All right, next concept that we have to talk about is electric fields. So we got an idea of charges and a little bit of charge transfers. Uh, we'll have to add on to that, of course, when we talk about circuits, because that's a whole bunch of charges moving. But now we gotta talk about electric fields so that we can understand electric forces. Now, this slide and this, in this relationship that I'm setting up here um, is essentially a concept only. The equation on here, this slide, you do not need to know, but you need to know how it relates, one thing relates to another. Okay, and the AP will be more than willing to test you on that. First, let's go back to when we were talking about gravity. Okay, we had Newton's universal law of gravitation, and we talked when we went next door, um, and uh, we had the stretching material that we put the, you know, a little bowling ball thing in and saw how everything orbits. We added all that. We're going to relate that back to what we're doing now in electric fields. So first of all, if this, this area right here is my blank space, this is my uh, uh, stretching material right here I had next door. Well, if I, pay, I place a mass, right, into that space, what happens? Well, a gravitational field, right, is set up right inward towards the planet. Now, if you imagine what we did in the uh, simulator next door, right, we said, oh, this thing dipped down into that. And these lines are just showing the downward direction right here, right? And if you lived right here on Earth, you know that G value was you know 9.8, but you lived out here, that G value was something else, right? And we actually had to go calculate that, which was this. So we learned how to calculate this, and of course, if we use the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth, then it was 9.8, right? But we could actually calculate this for using something else. All right, so now what we're going to say, so mass in space creates a gravitational field. Oh yeah, and here's the G value right there. Now, but if I put a charge into space, all right, what happens? Well, I'll put mass into space and a gravitational field arises. Well, I put a charge into space, and guess what? A electric field arises in that same way, except for a fundamental property being mass, this fundamental property is charge. Same thing, it, it warps the space around it, alters space around it, and just like a gravitational field does. And it creates an electric field, what we would call big E. Okay. Now, if you look at this, the gravitational field is big G times mass of the Earth divided by its radius, uh, sorry, the radius, distance between, distance to the center of mass uh, squared. If you look at the electric field, this is a constant. This is the amount of charge, and this is also the distance squared. So look at this, constant versus constant. 
uh, mass versus charge, and then distance from the charge, uh, distance from the mass, and distance from the charge squared. Same thing, right? The same setup. The differences here are two things. One, this is a value 9.9 .9 times 10 to the ninth, okay, versus 6.67 times 10 to the negative eleventh, which is much, much less. Right, that's one difference. And the other difference is, is it matters, it matters whether you are using a positive charge or a negative charge. Because this is a negative charge here. What it, when I put a negative charge in the space, all right, space, you know, as we saw in that little simulator thing, space dips down and it sinks, right? And things slope downward uh, into it. Where it gets weird, and I can't use that simulator next door anymore, is, all right, is that for positive charges, I'm gonna draw one that I'm pretend this is positive here. For positive charges, something odd happens. Instead of space dipping down like we had in that you know, other one, what's, what actually happens is that the charge would actually lift up. So let's say this is a positive. Let me make, make this a positive now, all right? So what actually happens is that this space is altered and things kind of move away from it. So it'd be like if I put a bowling ball on that stretchy you know, spandex material, uh, that lycra, and then that bowling ball just lifted up, you know, and everything sloped away from it. And that's something I can't do uh, in this way. But I can do it with the simulation. So let's, let's look at this simulation now. Let's clear this off and get over here. Um, that was my charges one that I skipped. I'll go ahead and close that one out. Okay, so here's my simulation. Let's go full screen. All right, um, I should go back. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this and I'm going to, I have a list of uh, have some uh, charges down here. Um, make sure I got everything set. Okay, yep. So I'm going to put a charge into space. So here's my black material, my stretchy stuff, put a charge in space, what happens? Ah, okay, everything dips. Everything dips down to it. So imagine this is like the arrows are pointing downhill. They do always point downhill. Okay. So everything dips down to it. The closer you know, it is, the greater the dip, the farther away, again, uh, the less dip. That's shown by the brightness of the arrows here and the darkness of the arrows out here. Okay? Uh, you can see if I put more charge, like just like I did, I put more mass, what happens? All right, the, the dip gets bigger and bigger, as you can see, and more and more severe. So let's, uh, let's reset this now. All right? Now, but if I put a positive charge in the space, what happens? Ah, everything moves away from it, like it's uphill, right? Everything moves away from it. So if I have this positive charge, let's say about right here, everything is moving away from it, like that. But if I put this negative charge right here, then everything's, this is dipping down. So this is, you know, way high mountain above sea level, and this is a way low valley below sea level, okay? And so this goes downhill, and this goes um, downhill also. So the arrows always point what I saw called downhill. If you think about that stretching material that we're, we looked at um, in, the, in, the, in the lab next door, in the little simulator. Okay, so, but the key thing is that I put a charge in space and an electric field arises. Okay, and we'll come back to this in just a second uh, to talk about this some more. Go through all the sequence again. Okay. Uh, by the way, this is very similar to magnetic fields. You put a magnet into space, and guess what? It also warps uh, space. Um, uh, you also have the same thing in north and the south pole being opposite things. The one thing that is different about gravity, though, is it only has inward uh, gravitational fields. Right? Uh, electric fields can be inward or outward. Magnetic fields can be inward or outward. Um, same thing. Now. This is, that's, that's a bridge concept. This is actually one that you do need to know mathematically and be able to calculate. And that's the idea of uh, gravitational force and electric force. Now, I put a mass into space. What happens? Electric, I'm oh, sorry, gravitational field arises. Draw those lines again. All right? But if 
I put a mass near it, like the moon or just some other kind of mass, you know, what happens? Well, a, a gravitational force arises. So this gravitational force arises. And I guess, remember, it's both ways. Gravitational force is both ways, okay? So this is attracted to that, and that is attracted to that. So there's no force without two objects. One object creates a field, the other object, now a force arises. This was uh, Newton's universal law of gravitation, all right, that we used. And again, this is mass one, which is the mass of the Earth in this case, and this is mass two, which is shown right here. And this is a distance between the center of those masses uh, from each other. So what we're going to say now, I put a charge in the space. All right, go back to my red. This is negative charge, so the field lines go inward. Okay. Put a charge in the space. Now, if I put another charge near it, a force arises, but it's not necessarily attractive. Gravity can only have an attractive force. Now, if I put a charge in the space, it can be an attractive or repulsive force. Remember, opposites attract, like charges repel. These are opposites, so an electric force would arise. That would go like this. That's my electric force right there, right here. And then this one would have the same. All right? Now, again, if this was a negative charge, then it would be a repulsive force. It would push it out this way. And it would, this one would go, you know, pour, uh, go that way too. So that's the difference. All right? Attractive or repulsive. Now, what's also the same? The electric force, which is right here, is equal to a constant times, well, instead of mass 1, I have charge 1. And instead of mass 2, I have charge 2. And instead of the distance between the center of masses of the two char uh, masses, uh, then I have distance between the centers of the two charges, right? So exact same structure and everything, right, to this as we did with gravity. And this is something that the AP exam loves to talk about, right? Now, the difference, though, the difference is these values right here. I'm going to go to another color just so I can uh, really... So this is a small, small number. So imagine that this was one kilogram, and this was one kilogram, and this was one meter away. If I had these all ones, and I multiply this, I'd get a teeny tiny force. You know, this much force. But imagine I had one coulomb, and one coulomb that were one meter away. All right, and then that would be multiplied by this nine times ten to the ninth. You'd have a huge difference, an order of magnitude of twenty times. I'm sorry, uh, 20, ten to the twenty, all right, times more force that would come. Which I mean, one coulomb is a large thing, but the key thing is that this, the electric force, is much much greater because of this constant. All right, so all things being equal, the electric force would be much much greater than the gravitational force. All things being equal is the uh, caveat there. Now this is called Coulomb's law, all right? In the uh, let's see, in the equation sheet, which actually I recommend, you know, thinking about this, they have it written like this. Which I think is like the, or maybe it's uh, let me go back. And it's just like the mag. So it's it's the the magnitude of the four electric force is equal to, and then these are magnitudes of charges. So you can either do like the actual charge one being like negative or positive times this, and if it's negative, then it's attractive. If it's positive force, it's repulsive. Or you can just calculate, you know, the general, the amount of force, and then just use logic to say, oh, this is positive, that's negative, so it's attractive. Uh, or that's positive, that's positive, it's repulsive. Or that's negative, that's negative, it's repulsive. Now, we're going back to forces, which means when I add up all my forces, I get a vector sum of all the forces, which gives you the actual net force. Okay, so keep that in mind when we do these following problems. So this is Coulomb's Law, and it's on your yellow sheet. So, so let's do an example. Um, I have two plus 10 nanocoulomb charges. I'll draw one right here, plus 
10 nanocoulomb, and I do another one over here, plus 10 nanocoulomb. And they are two centimeters apart on the x-axis. What is the net force on a plus one, I'll make it smaller, it doesn't have to be smaller, plus one nanocoulomb charge midway between them. What is the net force? So the question, okay, so in order to understand this one, I have to do two things, right? Because I have to think about what's acting on it. And, I, and actually, you know, it doesn't say anything about gravity and stuff like that. So we'll, we'll ignore gravity stuff and say that this is just a, uh, much more dominant. Uh, we don't have any masses anyway. So I'll say, you know, what's touching it? Oh, nothing. Okay, what's well, acting on it from distance? Well, now we used to just say weight, but now we actually have, um, you know, electric forces that can act on it. From distance. Okay, so we have electric forces. All right. If I draw a free body diagram, by the way, it's 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 convenient to call these things. So I'll call this Q1, Q2, and Q3. All right. So what what forces? And Q1 is uh, has a force on Q3. All right. Uh, and since they're the same charge, there's a repulsive force going this way. And this is the force of one on two, uh, sorry, one on three. All right, uh, but Q2 is also exerting a force on Q3 in the other direction, the force of two on three, okay? Now, um, actually, conceptually, you could look at this and say, okay, well, this, the value of this force should be the same as this force. Because also know that this is equally, this is exactly halfway, so this is one centimeter, you know, and that's uh, one centimeter. So I know that these should be equal. But let's go ahead and calculate what that would be. So the electric force is K, nine times in the ninth, Q1, Q2 over the distance between them squared. All right, so electric force, let's start plugging in our values. K is 9 times 10 to the 9th. Q1, um, actually, so to make this reflect what it is, Q3, Q1, 3. Uh, Q1 is positive 10 nanocoulombs. Nano is times 10 to the negative 9th. Okay. And Q3 is 1 nanocoulomb, which is 1 times 10 to the negative 9th. And what's the distance between them? Well, this needs to be in meters. So this is the same as 0 0.01 meters. 0 0.01, but I have to make sure I square that. Okay? And so let's do that. I could probably think about it, but I'm, I'm not in that mood today. And I'll go ahead and calculate negative 9 times 1, negative 9, divided by 0 0.01 squared. And the value I get for an electric force between them is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 9 times 10 to the negative fourth. Make sure that's right. Yes. And that's going to be in newtons. Okay. 9 times 10 to the negative fourth uh, newtons. And that is the force between 1 and 3. Okay, so this is 9 times 10, this is 9 times 10 to the negative fourth, which also means that this is 9 times 10 to the negative fourth. Okay, uh, you can see they're going in opposite directions, so they will cancel out. So the first for part A, their you know, force net is the sum of all my x forces, which is 0 newtons. Okay, for part B, what if we uh, place this one on the right, right, with a, um, what if we replaced it with a negative charge? So I made this a negative charge. Well, what would that change? All right, so for part B, what I would get is a force diagram. Well, Q1 is still pushing Q3 to the right, so that's still there. Force of 1 on 3 is still the same value. But I also get that now Q2 is pulling on Q3. I'm sorry, Q2 is, yeah, pulling on Q3. 
right? And then all that would change, again, this equation right here and this value would change, uh, the only thing that would change would be the direction, right? So it would be the same value. So essentially, now, instead of 9 times 10 to the, instead of 9 times 10 to the, uh, um, to ninth, I had, I add those together, 9 times 10 to the, sorry, negative 4th, uh, plus 9 times 10 to the negative 4th, one of them being that one, one of them being that one, and so I get 18 times 10 to the negative 4th, but that's a bit of a no-no, as far as scientific uh, notation, 1.8 times 10 to the negative 3rd newtons. Okay, and that's part B. Okay, so you see how it goes, we're back to forces, we're back to vectors, and things like that. And next up, we're going to have a little more complicated situation, but again, it's nothing that we haven't done in the past, it's just a little bit new uh, with charges, right? and a little bit different orientation, we're not worried about weight and some other things, but we do have to deal with the vectors. You have the diagram here of three charged particles, one, two, and three. Um, these are 10 centimeters apart, you know, this is five centimeters this way, so we know some of these things. What is the net force on charge three due to charge one and charge two? I like to start with uh, directions, okay? So first of all, what's going to happen? Well, charge one interacts with charge three, right? And they are opposite charges. So what's going to happen? There's going to be a pull this way, okay? This is the force of one on three. Now, this one's going to interact, all right, and have a force with charge three, but because they're the same charges, it's going to be a push this way, two on three, all right? So let's calculate those values first, and then we'll get to the vector addition thing later. All right, so electric force of one on three is equal to K, which is nine times 10 to the ninth. Uh, Q1 on Q3 and distance squared. All right, K is nine times 10 to the ninth. Q1 is negative 50. I don't really care about direction right yet. All right, I already got that indicated. So 50 nanocoulombs times 10 to the negative ninth. Uh, charge 3 is 30 times 10 to the negative ninth. Okay, now that's uh, divided by the distance between them squared. So don't, don't jump and say 5 centimeters because that's not true. All right, I gotta figure out what that distance is. If this is five, and this is five, then what is this distance right here? Well, this is a right angle. So this becomes the square root of 25 plus 25 square root of 50. It should be about seven, yep, 7.07. .07. So this is 7.0, uh, yeah, 7.07 .07 is what we'll use. Okay, so this is 7.07, .07, and that has to be squared. Okay, so let's go in the calculator now. 9 EE e 9 times 50 EE e, uh, negative 9 times 30 EE e, negative 9 divided by, oh, sorry. I almost made a mistake. All right, this is seven centimeters, so I can't use that, so I have to use 0 0.0707 meters. My bad. But I hadn't actually made that mistake yet. 0 0.0707. Okay, so I get an electric force between these of, uh, let's see, 0 0.00. 0191. Right? If I did 1, 2, 3, 4, it'd be 1.91 times 10 to the negative fourth newtons. Okay? And that's the force of 1 on 3. So that's how much this is being pulled. 
um, 1.91 times 10 to the negative fourth. Okay, Newtons. Okay, now I got to go do force of Q on uh, Q2 on Q3. All right, it's a being a push force there. Uh, but if, actually, I'll pause for a second. It's going to be the exact same equation uh, because this is 50 nano and this is 30. Uh, the direction is different, but I already got that noted here. I don't like putting it into this equation. So actually, this is going to be the, that same value. So I know that F uh, E2 on 3 is also 1.91 times 10 to the negative fourth newtons. Okay. So I know both of those. Um, but I can't add them together like I did in part B of that last problem because they're actually at angles. So what I'm going to do is come over here. I'm going to do some vector addition. All right. So I'm going to get this right. And this is a force, uh, I'll just call it one on three. I don't want to write all those numbers. And then I have this two on three. Here's my axis here. Here's my Y. All right. So what I need to know is what is this angle? And what is this angle? Because what I need to do, and I like to get my fancy colors here, is I need to break this uh, F13 into a X. And I need to make F23 into an X. This is F13. Try and write small X. F23 X. All right, and then also. See, I got any fancy? No, I have to go with yellow. Um, I'm gonna change this into a Y. F one three Y two three Y. Okay, so I need to break into X and Y. In order to do that, I need to know what that angle is. Well, if I go back to this, um, okay. Fifth, Five, five, these are equal sides. So this is actually a 45, 45 triangle. Okay, so if this is 45 and I'm looking at this angle, right, from here, this is also 45. All right, so I know this is 45 degrees. So these two, these two forces will be the same. And this is also 45 degrees here because um, it would be a push like this, and this is 45 high, and this is 45 low, so this is also 45. So good news, everybody. I only have to actually calculate one thing, because if this force is the same as this one, and this angle is the same as this one, then this Y will be the same. And if this is a Y upwards, and this is a Y downwards, then these are going to cancel out. So the only thing I'm actually interested in is this, and whatever I calculate for one of them, I can just double. So let's go there. So that means that I'll, I'll calculate F13 is equal to, uh, this is F13X, sorry, is equal to F13, this force right here, times cosine of the angle, uh, which is 1.91 times 10 negative fourth uh, newtons times cosine 45 degrees okay make sure I'm in degree mode okay 1.91 um, actually I'll just use my answer uh, times cosine 45 degrees in degree mode and I get um, is 1.35 times 10 to the negative fourth. And again, that is what this X is right there. And so essentially, I know that twice this value, you know, is my total. With this being the one on three and this being two on three right there, they add up. And so this becomes what, 2.7 times 10 to the negative fourth uh, newtons and that is my net force magnitude 
Uh, now I've got to give it direction. Uh, well, also good news, I don't have to do sine, cosine, or tangent. Um, I can just go and just say to left. To the left or 180 degrees from the positive x-axis or uh, it doesn't say north, south, east, west, so I can't necessarily use that, but uh, I'm fine with that. Okay. Uh, so actually this one isn't so bad. This one's actually pretty mild and tame compared to a lot of ones in uh, the college classes. All right, next one, let's mix together some forces. Not just one force, but multiple. A small plastic sphere is charged to negative 10 nanocoulombs. It's held 10 centimeters above a small glass bead at rest on the table. The bead has a mass of 15 milligrams and a charge of positive 10 nanocoulombs. What will, the what will the charge leap up to the plastic sphere? Uh, and that should be question mark right there. Will it leap up to the sphere? So let's draw a picture right here by my record button. Let's draw a picture. All right, so I have a glass bead that is at rest at the table. The bead um, as let's see, I'll say as a mass of 15 milligrams and it has a charge, and I'll call this Q2, charge of 10 nanocoulomb. Okay. Um, okay, up here I have a small plastic sphere. Doesn't matter what this mass is, but it has a charge of negative 10 nanocoulomb. All right, now this is at rest uh, to begin with. Um, so it says, will it leap up to the, pla to the plastic sphere? Basically, in order for it to no longer be at rest and to leap up, there must be an acceleration upwards, which means there must be an imbalanced force, which means when I do my free body diagram for, you know, for this thing right here, and do it over here, is that for this um, glass bead, well, what's going on? What's, uh, what's touching, you know, the, um, what's touching? Well, normal force, okay, fine. So you got normal force here. And while it's sitting there, right, it's opposing the weight, okay? Now, as the electric force, which is also there, as this electric force increases, what happens is that that normal force actually decreases. So we want to know is this electric force, essentially we can ignore it. What I'm trying to say is that we can ignore the normal force, right? Because, you know, if it starts moving, then that normal force is going to be zero. So that's really the condition that we're, we're worried about. So the electric force here, right? You know, again, if it, if it doesn't leap up, it's going to pull on it, but if it doesn't leap up, then there will be a normal force. But if it does leap up, then there will not be one. Okay. So when is this electric force greater than the weight? And also saying when is the normal force not needed? Okay, it's essentially what we need to find. Well, first let's let's set it. Uh, actually, no, let's calculate each one separately and see which one's dominating. Well, let's go to our old one that we know how to do. Uh, the weight is m times g. So what's my mass? Uh, my mass is 1 point, uh, 115 milligrams, and again, milla is times 10 to negative 3. That's going to be multiplied by 9.8. So let's find that weight. That weight is 15 ee uh, negative 3 times 9.8. Okay, and that is 0 0.147 newtons. Okay, so that's how much it weighs. So now I've got to calculate the electric force and see if it is greater or less than that weight. If it's greater than that weight, it'll leap up. Um, if it's less than, then it'll stay there. Okay, so K times Q1, Q2, uh, Q, I'm oh, sorry, this is not Q3. <laughs> it's uh, distance between them squared. Okay. Um, this is 9 times 10 to the ninth, and this is Q1 is negative 10 
nanocoulombs. I don't care about the negative times 10 to the negative ninth. And Q2 is also 10 nanocoulombs, so Q10 times 10 to the negative ninth. Um, okay, the distance between them, what do we know this is? Um, oh, one centimeter, right? Which is going to be 0 0.01 meters. And that gets squared. Don't forget to square it, kids. 9EE9 e, e, nine times 10EE9 e, e, times 10EE9. E, e, and that's going to be divided by 0 0.01 squared. Oops, yep. I forgot to put negative nines for those. Okay, so that's much, much different. Uh, so 0 0.00920 newtons. Okay. So will this charge leap up? And let me make sure I did my calculations correct. Okay. Will it leap up? The answer is no, because weight is much greater than this electric force right here. Okay. Uh, because it, this electric force is actually less than this, in order for it to stay there, of course, there actually has to be a, there will be a normal force. But again, we were just testing the condition where the electric force, you know, was greater than the weight for that. So there will be normal force, but uh, we only know that because of this is less than that. Okay, last part of this, we're going to talk about something called potentials, all right? So if I go back to this whole idea of you have mass that you put in space and electric field is created, and here's my field lines, again, always sloping in, you know, like we had in the spandex stuff, material. All right, if I, you know, they get more intense, you get more gravitational uh, p potential, I guess, or, you know, gravitational uh, field, the closer in, and then the farther out you go, it gets less and less. Well, it you know, there's a spot here that is a certain distance above the Earth, which has the actual same potential as another spot here. And another spot here. All right? And so if we had mapped all of those, of course, it's very obvious for this type of thing, there would all be the same, if you had a certain mass there, it would all have the same potential energy because they're the same distance away. All right, so this is an obvious thing. Now, you know, essentially, a mass here, a mass here, a mass here, and a mass there all has uh, the same gravitational potential energy, mgh, or we'd said mgy. Um, and it's because they have the same mass and they have the same what we call gravitational potential, which is just a combination of the g value and the height. Okay. Now, for electric fields, we have the same thing. You have an inward, you know, field like this, right? And there's an electric field that's there, and the electric field value right here is the same as the electric field value here, again, because they're all the same distance away, just in different things like this, right? And so we actually have the same effect. If you take a charge away from another charge, the value of the potential energy of the charge uh, decreases, right? So again, if I take another charge, move it out of here, this potential energy the same as out here, so on and so on. Another way to look at it, and this is my favorite way to look at it, uh, is that I'll go back to the simulator uh, right here. All right, so I have my two charges here. I told you that this was on top of a mountain. All right, that's on top of a mountain, and this is down in a valley. And not only on top of a mountain, down in a valley, but, you know, this is way above sea level, and this is way below sea level. All right, if we're talking about elevation. So... If I take out my little scope here, this shows me what I want to, it shows potential, and I'll explain that, but I'll say this shows me elevation. So if I go on top of the mountain, to the tippy top peak of the mountain, I get some high, high elevation right here, right? It's an infinitely tall kind of peak or whatever, but if I have some high elevation, it's showing me a positive value right there. If I go down from the mountain in down into the valley, you can see it starts tailing off like this. There actually has to be a point between that mountain and that valley, the 
mountains way above sea level and the valleys way down below sea level where there must actually be a sea level. And then guess what happens is they go back down and go closer and closer and I'm down below sea level and I'm going farther and farther into this you know big trench or you know this big point right here. What I want you to see though is that if this is my tippy top of the mountain right here and I go right here there's a point where the value of this elevation, we're talking about elevation, is the same all the way around it. And actually, if I were to move this all the way around like this, I'd have to be very careful. You know, it'd be roughly about the same, but I can actually show you this with one little click. Right? Every spot on that circle has the exact same, what I'll call, elevation. Right? It has the same elevation. Right? If I go farther down the mountain, Everything on that circle right there has the exact same elevation. And I go farther down the mountain, everything on that right there has the same elevation. If I keep on going, then they all have the same elevations because they have the same what we call potential. Now, ooh, I just found a special spot. Right, as I get right here, it gets tricky because it, you know it's a nice flat area all, all around the outside here that kind of it follows. Same thing here. This is the bottom of a ditch or a little valley down there. These all have the exact same things. And so what this is setting up is something called uh, potential, right? So, you know, all everything on this line has the same potential, um, which is saying, you know, in our analogy of mountains and valleys have uh, the same um, uh, elevation, okay? Right. And if, basically, if this is a mountain and you're a hiker, you could walk up to here, you could hike up here, and then you could walk along this green line and you'd never change elevation. You'd just be walking around the mountain, not going up or down. Now, if you did go up, you'd go from this elevation to this elevation. Right? You have changed your elevation. So what is your change in elevation? What's your final elevation minus your initial? You've had a positive change in elevation. Well, in our words, we're going to use potential. You go from this potential to this potential, right? What's the change in potential? Well, it's your final minus initial. Another way of saying that, what's the difference between your potentials, right? Well, it's this final potential minus your initial potential. So we can say that at any two points, I can, you know, fictionally go from here to here. If I just look at this, it's just, I just know the elevation here, I know the elevation there ask what's the difference between the two, right? And that sets up our, um, the thing that we'll talk about, which is um, a potential difference in potential fields. So what we're gonna do is equate high potential to high elevation, low potential to low elevation, right? And again, this is a contour map. Uh, these can be pretty complicated to see, but again, if here's a peak right there, and you go down that mountain a little bit and you walk around that circle right there, you're, you're walking on flat things. You're not going up, you're not going down as long as you stay on that circle. All right? It gets kind of complicated here. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what's a peak and what's a valley. A little more simpler one is this. All right? But if I go from 1,000 feet to 5,000, 500 feet, what's the final minus initial? What's my change in potential? What's my difference? Well, that's negative 500, so on, so on. But so if it's high to low, it's going to be a positive change in potential but if it goes from low uh, from high to sorry high to low is negative and low to high is positive okay and that's something we call the potential difference now um, as you may have noticed we use uh, V for this because potential difference is the phrase we're going to use instead of change of potential but we're also going to use the word voltage all right and this ties into our Next part, which is circuits and batteries and things like that, right? Which is very important. Just like you walk uphill and downhill, you can gain or lose potential energy. Uh, and, you know, you go from one fictional elevation or whatever to another fictional elevation, um, right? So this is what we call voltage. And we'll kick back to this when we talk about batteries and circuits, okay? And that'll be in our next section.